This episode of Fresh and Buds is brought to you by Down But Not Out Coats, folks. Made by, well, you guessed it, Down. And they are certainly comfy, especially here in the summertime in Wraith. I feel great in this jacket. Down But Not Out, but also Fresh and Buds now. Fresh and folks welcome back to yet another episode of fresh and buds i'm your host tommy fresh and you are all of my buds and today we are joined once again by our dear bud from over in europe it is erica forschloff how are you doing my friend what is new what's going on with you i'm good thank you so much for having me again it's, it's been a while <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, a lot of things has been uh, going on i've been uh, relaxing a little bit on the flesh and blood side of things i started a new job back in february so there's been a lot of my time and energy going into that learning new things learning a new team and a new job basically so uh, it's been a lot with that and i also have taken a little bit of a step back done some other priorities in my life in terms of like taking care of myself a bit more this year uh cutting back a little bit on the armories maybe doing only one armory a week instead of like two or three times a week like i did last year it was a lot uh so he's prioritizing myself a little bit more this year trying to go for more runs going to the gym taking care of myself a little bit more essentially I love to hear that because, you know, it's it is so easy to kind of go all in and, and just kind of like really push the envelope all the way on one end of the spectrum. You don't want to be on the other end of the spectrum where you're not doing anything. It's like about right. finding that happy medium. So I, I totally understand. Like, it's tough. It's tough to like, you know, find time for everything. I mean, you got to find mm. the balance, which I'm glad that you are, are doing that now. And it has been a while since we chatted last. I believe last time it was like right before Worlds in Barcelona. And we were were chatting about metrics and, you know, basically it it feels so crazy that Bright Lights uh, was not even that long ago, but it feels very long ago because we're already uh, two sets removed from it. But um, how was Worlds for you? Because we had chatted about it. You had, you know, hinted at some things. How was your experience in, in Barcelona? Oh God, that was a blast. It was such an amazing experience and I got to meet so many people and it was so overwhelming because there was like all of these people from all around the world that you like seen and heard of about Twitter and YouTube and various streams in the past that all like coincided in this one location and we all came together and uh, had a blast. Uh, Worlds was absolutely amazing and I got to do the honors of doing the cast of course together with the amazing team there and uh, yeah. I was completely overwhelmed, but uh, hopefully I did a great job in the end. And it was uh, very exhausting uh, at the end of it all. And uh, so many awesome games, so many awesome comebacks, so many awesome stories that we shared uh, throughout that weekend. So uh, I'm absolutely joyful and uh, happy that I got to experience that. Yeah, well, I mean, gosh, I mean, it's been a while now, but from what I remember, uh, you did an excellent job in the booth and and it was was awesome to see you there. And I'm hoping that means that we're going to see more of you in the booth because, you know, we we want some great talent in the booth, of course, and you are that. And, you know, how did you like doing that? Because that is such a big stage to do it. Like Worlds is, you know, the biggest event in flesh and blood, really, you know, each year, you know. Did you like that? Did you like the big pressure of being in a huge situation like that? Would you like to do more of that? So I didn't feel a lot of pressure because typically when you sit in the booth, it's only you and whoever it is that you're co-casting with that you are there with, right? So I typically don't get the same stage fright as you would typically do when you talk in front of so many people. Because when I sit there, I don't really know how many people are watching. I can imagine there's like... A thousand, maybe, <laughs> at that point, right? Uh, but when I sit there, it's just me and my co-caster, right? And we were just watching this game and we just get to enjoy and explore and talk about it. And so that is my main focus going through when I cast. So, like, enjoying the whole experience and, yeah, like, try to perfect my cast a little bit. Like, having Brian Gottlieb there, I got some uh, assistance and, like, yeah, hi, how can you help me provide some feedback so I can improve on my casting? Because he's, like, been doing this for a while, right? So he knows the ins and outs and he's, like, a natural at this. And I'm just, just like, 
new in this space and trying to improve and improve my language barrier that is not like since English is not my first language right that is like one of the first things to just get through like expanding on the vocabulary and trying to find the new words to say the same thing basically to make it a little bit more flavorful and a bit more exciting to listen into and also just finding those key moments and what to talk about and when you see something that is going on and try to bring the audience through what is going on and uh, how are the people or how are the players reacting to what is going on and how are they going to counter whatever is going on like it's uh, it's such a blast yeah it is such a uh, a delicate balance of you know explaining some things you know sometimes you have to assume that maybe maybe the viewer doesn't know what's going on and you know then there's also beyond that you want to kind of create a uh, an atmosphere for the big moments in the game that you know make it a very fun and entertaining kind of uh viewing experience you know we, we we're seeing more and more of that in this game and i think flesh and blood is one of those games that is very conducive to like these really big moments uh you know as much as it can be in a, a paper card game you know th- which is i exactly. think it, <laughs> it's still pretty cool now you know what are some things that that you found yourself kind of holding on to in terms of uh casting and 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 just doing commentary in general that if if you know, any of the listeners out there were planning on doing maybe commentary at their LGS, you know, for like a little live stream, what would, what would be like a tip or trick that you would give them? I think depends on what you want to do, because typically you have something called a color caster, which is the one like providing the insights and providing the detailed uh, itinerary of the things that is going on. Typically, the more experienced uh, person has that driver's seat, right? And then you typically have the play-by-play caster, who is the one telling the stories, trying to find the narrative, is the one like enters you into the stream and tries to create a cozy atmosphere to lean onto, and then asking the color caster the good questions that they can uh, then jump off on. So it's a bit of a mix on what you want to prioritize in terms of what you like to cost. I mean, if you're not as experienced, then maybe a play-by-play commentator might be easier for you to have an entry way. But if you feel that you are an experienced caster, if you are the person that people come to and ask for insights or tips and tricks on how they can improve their game, then definitely look to lean more into color commentary where you can provide some good insights and exciting tidbits about the different matchups, how to strategize or any of those good insights. Like personally, I really, really enjoy a cost where you get to hear a lot of these insights right from players who are probably at the higher level than you are who can give you that uh, tidbit of information that you probably wouldn't uh, know or see going into it but like when they see it and you're like yeah but this is the reason why he's blocking this way or why he's um, acting or pre- um, play, uh, want to play these type of cards instead of those cards and how he wants to play out his turn and um how he maybe move his strategy inside the mid game and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things to keep track of. And the more experienced you are with the the bigger variety of decks, the better. One of the things for me that was a real big struggle was that we went into Barcelona not really knowing what the meta was going to look like. So there were some situations where you would end up in a situation where you have a hero that you don't really know <laughs> because you haven't played that much. We had a Teclavossen on stream in the first couple of games, I remember, in Barcelona. And it was just like... Okay, I just need to read through the deck list and try to like understand what his strategy is going into. Of course, I understand that he wants to try and and get to his mech suit and try to just pop off right. But like the way to get there and like just following along and try to understand what is going on as it's happening and try to make sense of it all, that was really, really tricky. Uh, but I think we did a pretty solid uh, effort there. And the Tecla wasn't went to took it down. It was really, really impressive. So... Yeah, and uh, yeah. it's it's kind of interesting because there's just going to be more and more here. Like, there's going to be more heroes entering the game than leaving the game, at least in CC at this rate. Anyway, you know, we just got three new, yeah. and there hasn't been uh, uh, one that's hit LL since Dromai, I don't think. Although Ko is is close, but I don't think we'll hit uh, before Amsterdam. But um, it is interesting. Now you mentioned the color commentary versus the play by play. What side do you like to be on more? So I typically did the color commentary when I started commentating in Antwerpen. That's the position I was uh, placed in because I I have done so many games at this point in time that that is what I was most comfortable with. And also in uh, Barcelona, I was also in the color commentator seat together with Brendan Patrick, who did the play-by-play excellently. And so it was a very natural position for me to be in. I think when we did Warsaw, that was the first time I actively took a step into the play-by-play seat, uh, typically because uh, that's kind of what I had to do because uh, 
our fellow uh, commentator got a little bit uh, sore throat there in uh, the midst of uh, the action. So we had to pull in some extra games and had some extra commentators coming in, helping us out throughout the day. So uh, basically I get to try out the play-by-play uh, seat uh, for a couple of games and it was so much fun and uh, it was a, a little bit of a challenge to like change your perspective a little bit <laughs> and try to have another focus around it and also be like the presenter in a way uh, but I had so much fun doing that and it was such a nice challenge and it was such a nice change of pace for me and uh, also being able to bring in Maximilian Klein for a game and get his insight and just like uh, pull him in to get uh, all the juicy information that he could provide into that uh, atmosphere was also really good. Yeah, and it's so interesting because there's so many decision points in this game, right? And at both junctures, like for for the color commentator to go through those decision points, right? You know, and, and why each one is probably pretty important and why you can go with either one is probably important for the gameplay itself. The play-by-play, on the other hand, can look at those decision points and create the narrative for what's going on, maybe within that player's head who's going through the decision mm. points, which is uh, it's a nice balance there which is very cool now uh last we chatted you had had been doing some judging and i know you've you've said you've you've taken a, a step back from playing as much uh or even going to armories as much you know focusing on yourself got a new job have you been judging uh much more or or was uh you know what what is uh your stance or not stance but like where where are you in the judging world right now so I'm a passive uh, judger at the moment. <laughs> I typically run the weekly armories that we have for one of our LGSs. So that typically is when I put on the uh, judging hat. It was so funny during the um, the pre-release uh, because uh, everything was new for everybody. And there were so many judge calls. I don't think I've had that many judge calls during a pre-release ever. Because there were so many intricacies and so many good questions in terms of like, yeah, but if I attack with this blue aura, does th- is that considered a blue attack? for this uh, effect and such like that. And you're like, I don't know, that's a great question. <laughs> you're like looking through the release notes and trying to find uh, your your bearings. And that is typically the situation I find myself in now in a more casual setting uh, where I put on my judging hat. I don't have any judge situations going forward. And my focus right now is to become a better player and uh, go into Nats and uh, do be a player basically for our Swedish nationals happening first weekend of July. And um, yeah, I was contemplating if I should uh, try to go for Judge 2 because uh, I'm level 1. And uh, I did the Judge 2 test uh, last year and failed by one question on one of the two tests that you had to do. And so I was very close and I had the merits to do it with the UK Nationals last year that I helped judge and uh, one other Rotenets that I also judged last year. So that was basically my golden moment to do that. But then I also realized that they are going to push the envelope a little bit on the Judge 2 requirements and start to... Uh, basically, if you are a Judge 2, there's going to be more requirements for you to, in order to keep that level two moving forward so that's when i said you know what level one is good enough for me i'm not gonna uh, invest that much time into this space i feel here is good enough and so yeah that's where i landed yeah i mean well it's, it's good to have like the base knowledge there and, and even level one's like totally fine and yeah. you know we need some of them at least playing in the room at, at armory when you can't just have a judge so it's nice to have that and and you're right this set is very complicated and i mean i don't it was like one of the interesting pre-releases that i went to where so many people went to time not because of the gameplay it was more of like what is going on with this set so that was really interesting now you mentioned swedish nationals which is coming up in a month from when we're recording it sounds like and you know which i i've said before we started recording i'm jealous of because we have us nats next week next and I don't week know, yeah. i don't know what i'm doing and you know <laughs> i am so scared but um what are you what are you sleeving up these days is it something you know that you're enjoying and perhaps looking at to play next month or are you still in the tank to see where you might land so i played victor a lot in the last season before Mist Veil was uh, released and I had a great success with Victor in a couple of uh, Rotonets and uh, so I am leaning a lot into the Guardian as of late and I'm super scared of all of the new heroes that comes out with Mist Veil and how they're going to affect that meta and it's very much still up in the air. Uh, I think everyone can agree that the meta has never been so shaken up uh, by a new set ever and uh, 
big props to uh, Brian Gottlieb and James White and the, the rest of the LSS team for cracking out this set because all of a sudden I don't think we've ever had a case where all three new heroes are equally like debated in terms of like who is the king of the hill uh, in the meta right now and how are they disrupting and what else is out there that could disrupt this potential king of the hill and like whoever is the king of the hill. Like there's so many interesting discussions going on both on X and Twitter and slash Twitter and um, Discord and uh, everywhere else and we already saw a couple of uh, cool uh, upsets in the uh, Montreal and the uh, dream hacks of the weekend past and uh, we have more battle hardens and uh, such coming up this weekend and also nationals for USA next weekend after that so there's still a lot of things that could happen I still think that people are trying to understand where to go with all of these heroes I don't think a deck is like solidified by any stretch of the imagination because there's so many intricacies and so many things that need to pay into account in order to attune for whatever meta is uh, gonna land right so but for me right now uh, Victor has been uh, my focus for the past couple of months and since my time has been limited that's uh, where I have been uh, where I have solidified my time basically uh, tomorrow is gonna be my first armory uh, CC armory after the missed fail release and uh, I or- only have the cards <laughs> to play Victor I only have the cast homes or the um, <laughs> the uh, uh, new golden nuggets cards for Victor so uh, we we are probably leaning on that tomorrow. We will see uh, what will happen with that. If not, I'm still looking into Zen. I used to play Ninja a lot before diving into the Guardians because what happened was that I dived into Katsu. I loved Katsu a lot, but we had so many Guardians in our local meta that I just got dunked on. And it was like old teams all over the place. There was some Bravos and it was like not a good time. So what you typically do when you can't beat them, you join them. So I became a Bravo <laughs> mate for a while. Then Victor got released. And so I've been on Victor. Uh, for quite a bit now but uh, so I'm still like looking to see if uh, Zen or Katsu is uh, viable uh, going into this new meta as well yeah well you know we'll talk about it in a bit but it might be and and uh, it's funny enough that when all those Oldhams were running around like the way Katsu had to try and beat Oldham was like usually the crouching tiger kind of combo and mm-hmm. now we have a hero that just does that so uh, it might be uh, an interesting uh, kind of thing now Let's get to the fresh faves. Obviously, when you were on last time, we talked about your favorite um, cards of all the game. But now you get the honor of doing the first part of the Miss Vale, fresh faves, all of your favorite cards from this set. Let's start off hot with who was is your favorite hero from MST? Uh, oh god I, I got to play all of the three heroes in the pre-releases because I got to go to three of them so my focus was to try and be, uh, play a day a pre-release with each and one of them to get a flavor Enigma was by far the hardest uh, there were so many intricacies and so many instances you could play on both uh, your own turn and your opponent's turn so that unlocks a lot of different uh, lines that you could possibly go with it was super super tricky to find the perfect lines and super tricky to play but super fun at the same time we Probably leaned more into Zen at the end of the day. I had the only 4 0 I did during the weekend was on Nu. Um, so maybe, yeah, Nu, I think, was my <laughs> favorite in that sense. Yeah, well, you know what? We go with what wins here. Uh, and <laughs> exactly. and, and Nu is, new is pretty, pretty fun. Now, what's your favorite weapon out of the set? We only really got a little bit amount of them, so. Mm. I think the tiger taming Kakara is just uh, brilliant. Uh, like, uh, there's not that many ways for you to buff your tigers, and just having that go-to uh, way to just to attack with your tiger, and it has go again, and it comes in for two. So basically, a one for three if you have your tiger available, uh, go again. And so, using that for some type of fatigue strategies is uh, quite interesting depending on how many tiger generators you have in your deck that you can easily rely on that and also combo cards of course to uh, pump up with your zen ability at the end yeah the, that is the card that i've been swinging the most with lately um <laughs> absolutely i mean and having it swung against me to be honest now what was your favorite equipment we had a lot of cool stuff in this set uh, <laughs> God, I remember the names of these. Let's make a shake. Um, I think the only name I remember is the recurring nightmare one. Um, the mask. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the feet are Meridian Pathway, I think. <laughs> I, I, 
I just did a whole. The hair limb of the snake side is the only rare uh, <laughs> equipment that is in there, right? But it's so pretty. Like most of these cars are so pretty. Oh, yeah. You really knocked it out of the park with the art in this set. That's for sure. Um, can I choose any equipment? Because there's some cool equipment, equipment that came out in the generic slot as well. Oh yeah, I was just saying, you know, uh, the two I remember. The, and oh yeah, there's also Stonewall Gauntlet is another name I remember. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the heirlooms. Exactly. And uh, this is a nice little memory challenge for me. <laughs> me Talk, too. Talked about the set for six hours last week. Oh, wow. And it's in and out. Like most information that comes to me, folks. Yeah, there's so many names to keep track of, so it's hard. Um, what was the name of the... Yeah, Traverse the Universe. Just because the full art is so pretty, and I'm so jealous that everyone who's opening them up and showing them <laughs> off on Twitter is basically just solely because of the art is just fantastic. And uh, yeah, I think it's gonna see a lot of play with this. All like all of the three Mystic Zeros are uh, probably liking liking to play that one. Yeah, it's it's in practice like playing against it so far. That that card is insane, right? And. Mm. It's almost like when I play against New, I'm almost happy that they're playing the Mask of Recurring Nightmares. Not that that is a better option for me because it's it's terrifying, but you know, yeah. just just being able to go search a key is, is is pretty insane. Now, what was your favorite run of the mill card? Any card you throw into your deck that came out in this set? <laughs> I already talked about it, but Visit the Goldman Estate, of course, is like <laughs> slam dunk in the. The only problem with it is it's an attack action. Not it's not it's not an attack action card, right? So whenever you want to try and go for a full on clash uh, combination, you typically don't want to see that on the top of your deck because mm -hmm. that just fails your clashes, right? Uh, I just like recently threw out the Terra Sunder from my Victor deck because I didn't feel like they were. Uh, carrying their weight as much as they typically do in the general guardians like bravo for example is uh, seeing a lot more weight on those uh, than the victor in my opinion and also the downfall for like sw swapping that on top of your deck is not really great uh, so i'm yet to see where i'm gonna land with the uh, visit the golden estate at the end of the day but on the front side of it like how many people has been uh, swinging <laughs> some big attacks for um, with this one fronting it is like insane <laughs> amount of numbers so um, i'm excited to see where i'm gonna land with that one it is it is pretty fun it's like a more fun card but still powerful which i think is good for the game and the terra sunders i think almost is like probably a good idea to take out that card because the amount of times i'm seeing pictures of new playing other people's terra sunders that too is, that too <laughs> is insane i'm just like yeah i mean i would i would be so scared like i want to play terra sunder so i can play it right not my not my opponent so uh thank you for that all great options we're going to learn these cards a lot more as we draft it more, I'm sure. And then we, we won't have to look up uh, the names of them because they're a lot of them. I'll smack it in a month's time and I'll yeah, <laughs> flip <no>. this <laughs> 180. But it is the first one. Now, let's talk about these new heroes and kind of like what we think their kind of effects are on the meta and like how good they are because they're all pretty decent, it seems like. And, you know, we're officially, you know, as of this week, we're in a brand new meta. This past weekend, we had the first CC events of this uh, part the Misfilm meta. And uh, we're looking at the beginning of Nats season with US Nats next week, as, as we said earlier. And we just don't have a ton of data on really what this meta is going to look like. We can only speculate, mm. right? But there's no doubt that these new heroes are going to make some kind of impression, if not a huge impression. And it's looking like there might be something to be said about that because I have up here, because, you know, the nice thing about Ethan Mansant, shout out Ethan, mm. posts these pictures on Twitter. I can grab them. We have uh, the, the ProQuest Plus that they had in Montreal this past weekend had 108 players, which I think is a nice sample size here. And, you know, we had a pretty diverse meta here. Uh, the most, the three most represented decks were Nu, KO, and Zen at 12, nine and eight. And then we had a lot of sevens and sixes and then it kind of drops off from there. Uh, Enigma at six, but uh, not too surprised about KO being up there. Um, and and the, the talk of the town is Zen lately. And I know a lot of people are liking new. Um, is this something that you're shocked by this, this uh, kind of hero spread from Montreal? Uh, no, 
Not really. I mean, we saw Kano doing a lot of good numbers, both in Warsaw and the following Battle Hardens uh, after that, right before the Mist Veil mm-hmm. release. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's still a viable option uh, going into this new hero spread as well. And Ikma is probably one of the tougher ones, but and also Sen, uh, who can deal a, a bunch of damage <laughs> in a very <laughs> short term. And like, seeing a couple of uh, like two or three turns and just uh, hammering out like uh, 20 plus damage turns is just insane and so i think uh, kano is maybe gonna struggle a little bit more uh, going into this uh, meta but i'm not surprised to see at least uh, one of them going into this one in the top eight at least yeah yeah the top eight was pretty i mean it was i guess pretty diverse right we got two katsus which is kind of interesting zen's the the new uh, ninja on the block but Katsu say, you know what, hey, listen, I'm, they not show up. <laughs> I'm the original Mysteria hero. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be showing up. Uh, we had two Katsus in the top eight, uh, one Enigma, two News, Prism snuck in there, Akano, and, and of course, uh, your lovely Victor uh, snuck in there as well, which I'm surprised. Mm. I feel like it might not be the best Guardian meta, but, you know, Victor's still very powerful. Now... Enigma ended up taking it down. Uh, Noah Clark, mm. I think uh, Darkodius on on Twitter, mm, yeah, took it down, uh, beating Prism. Well, illusionist, illusionist, uh, violence right there, and then a new, and then finally a Katsu at the end. Enigma is certainly a powerful uh, hero, right? Because mm. you know, so different in terms of what the other illusionists have done, right? but also somewhat similar. But the ward thing is, well, it's also, first of all, very scary for Kano players, but but it also is uh, pretty intricate and has some weaknesses as well. Uh, what's your take on Enigma? Like, y- you mentioned that, you know, in pre-release you felt that she was very complicated. There's a lot of things going on with her, a lot of intricacies. You know, do you, does this small ProQuest Plus kind of, give validity to perhaps Enigma might be the better illusionist in the the format right now? Yeah, I mean, she doesn't suffer from the same uh, problems that uh, the OG, not OG, not even OG, the, the new G <laughs> Prism uh, has, right? With the Phantasm that can easily be popped by bigger attack numbers uh, on the opposing hero side, right? So all of these words are presenting a little bit of a different take or a different problem uh, towards that meta break. So... While we typically have a lot of good uh, ways to play around uh, Prism's uh, heralds and uh, wards, we see those wards being used at very much full effect for Enigma, where she can both use them for defensive capabilities and also for like offensive capabilities. Which is really interesting when you start thinking about that uh, Enigma also has the 40 life totals that uh, Prism, they decided that she just gonna set up with 32 and be done with that. <laughs> so Enigma has that full 40 available to her, which is huge. And then also all of these wards that she has capable to her that is just adding on top of that, that you need to break through somehow. Now, of course, there is these... Um, anti-wards effect that you have various uh, cards that can just break through uh, that doesn't care about prevention effects so these wards will just like pop and not do anything Mm -hmm. which is very very powerful so we'll see more of those cards being utilized moving forward for sure and so depending on how big enigma gets those uh, type of effects is probably and those type of heroes that utilizes those will probably see a lot more play going forward as well so it's going to be a lot of those uh, intricacies in terms of like what heroes are the most popular and there are so many ways that you can uh, deal with those heroes in effective ways with anti-prevention effects and such and so I think it's going to be very interesting but I think Guardian is probably the league that is going to have the least happiest times uh, going into this meta because both Prism and Enigma are both equally popular in a lot of sense and so those two on which plays Illusion is on two very different axes, and you need two separate uh, game plans moving into those. It's uh, very, very hard to find a sideboard option available for combating not only one Illusionist playstyle, but also a second one, right? So that's going to be super, super tricky moving forward. I think the Brutes are probably going to shine a little bit more, and so they're just going to be pounding on the powers and just uh, crushing through all of these effects, right? And just if they present enough numbers, it's probably going to do a lot. Leviah saw a, quite a big rise. We saw Chris Yali uh, taking down one of those PQs in uh, from the Dream Act, which was like 
I don't know, 12, 11 people <laughs> PQ plus, which was very cute. Uh, but nonetheless, like he managed to take that one down on Leviah. And uh, we also saw Matthew McKinnis taking down one of the other pro quests with Sen, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a lot of these heroes that is seeing a lot of success uh, in these early stages. But it's typically leaning more towards like who can deal the biggest numbers at the fastest rate uh, that is seeing the most uh, popularity in the beginning of uh, these meta shifts right before it likes settles down a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that I think has been true for like TCGs for a long time. Like I even, I remember like 15 years ago playing Magic, Red Deck wins would win the first tournament almost like every single time after a new set. And we're looking at, at that right now. I mean, Enigma's a little bit of a anomaly here at looking at the Montreal list. Uh, but, you know, we saw two Katsus, um, and uh, Akano make the, the top eight. I, I am surprised, you know, you mentioned the Brute thing, and I know Chris won uh, the pro quest with, with Levia. Levia is certainly powerful, right? You know, arguably has some of the best numbers, uh, you know, in the whole game, but unfortunately, I think has like a really, really tough time into new. New is, is <laughs> you want to be able to block right. some things and, you know, or block some things and then keep them in your graveyard but so it's kind of interesting to see where levi will will land you know in a in a larger meta but i was interested to see that ko although being you know nine of the 108 players uh in montreal didn't even make top eight uh ko right. was is or was the best deck going into this new set right uh, even got new toys from the, the armory deck, which, you know, we've talked about, you know, forever and ever and ever, you know, the sash is very mm. good and why to get it, but it certainly was still really good, but we're seeing it, not even a single one made the top eight. Do you think this is an anomaly or, or was just the sign of maybe KO is not the best deck anymore? Maybe. Uh, and I also think that one interesting uh, thing to think about here is also that the set released like two days before this pro quest happened, right? So like the timing for people to actually get some paper games into these new heroes and also getting the cards available to them in order to play these new decks also plays a factor in what we see in this meta. So probably a lot of the people that's going into this battle hardened are probably on their pet decks or like the decks that they used to play before the MST meta and probably feel that they don't have enough time alineas to practice something new or have the cards available to them to play something new so that might also like affect what we see in this first tournament going into the mst set right so i think that is what we see here that ko that was like the popular the most popular deck before mst still sees some popularity due to that fact right because of the availability and accessibility and people haven't played in paper as much because Playing in paper is so much different than trying to play online variants or uh, such. So it's really important to try to get those paper games in to get the feel for how things like look and turn out on paper. Uh, remember to tick your tunics and stuff like that is something that you yeah. need to keep track of. So like understanding how your game plan works out and uh, understand what the different uh, heroes that you're going to face and what your game plan is going into those various heroes is super, super important. And so not having that many hours into various heroes on the first weekend of a new set is understandable. So probably seeing a lot of uh, people still on uh, whatever they played before MST and still feel comfortable and probably feel like they have the best lenience basically uh, going into a first tournament of a new set with those in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, out of the top eight, three of the eight were were new heroes. Um, we talked about Enigma here taking down the tournament, you know, which was surprising that it was able. I, I'm not surprised it was able to beat New, uh, and like Prism, like Prism. I, that would be a really interesting kind of matchup to watch. I didn't get to see it, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I felt like Katsu might have a pretty good upper hand into Enigma based on just what I've seen, you know, especially in, in the limited format feels like Zen, you know, can present more wide damage to clear these auras a little bit more, but it was just interesting to see that. But we did have two news there, uh, including one mm -hmm. from my teammate, David Lee, shout out David. Um, new is ob obviously new. <laughs> new is new. And old is also new because new is 
such an interesting design here because it feels so powerful yet also not at the same time. I mean, this is going to sound weird when I say that, but like there are mm-hmm. certain matchups where I feel like new does not feel good at all. Right. It's very mm-hmm. polarizing. What's your take on new? And is this like the, the assassin that we should be looking at? Because Azuri was putting up numbers prior to MST and also got some new toys from this set. Yeah. No, I think Nu is very interesting in this new meta. And uh, as you mentioned, she already combats uh, what Usuri does really, really well. But Usuri has a little bit more combat tricks up her sleeve because she doesn't really leave up front what is going to be the side effects if you let this attack hit, right? So, so typically, Usuri can just play a stealth attack and then you can swap it in for whatever. And it's up to you to like gamble on, is this... Uh, is this an attack that I'm going to care about at the end of the day, right? And so sometimes you can come in with those CNC out of nowhere and you're just like, oh no, I really wanted to keep my... <laughs> and I can't really play in the D-Reacts. Oh no, everything is screwed. Uh, but Nu has to play basically everything up front a little bit more. And uh, she has a couple of combat tricks, but not in the same like powerful way that Usuri has, I believe. And it's a little bit more easier to read what Nu wants to do. And uh, it's easier to like navigate that matchup a little bit better. While Usuri is just like... Okay, I can either respect this or I cannot, and I have to pay the consequences or gamble a little bit in terms of what I think is gonna appear, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so Nu is a little bit more upfront with those things, but she can still present quite a lot of damage out of nowhere because sometimes they just have like all the attack reactions on the same card, and all of a sudden an attack that was presented for two or three is all of a sudden up in like twelve or <laughs> twelve or fifteen or something like that, and it's a lot, and so. It's a very scary proposition to to be in, and uh, I like I like to see where that is gonna land. If Azuri is uh, gonna still be like the go to uh, uh, assassin at the end of the day, or if uh, Nu is just uh, gonna have a stronger vibe, basically going into this. But since there were so many news going into this tournament, I think that helps quite a bit mm-hmm. with pushing those numbers in. And uh, yeah, I think that is the results that we that we see here. I think, there, yeah, there was only one Azuri <laughs> going into yeah. this tournament. So maybe it could also be that all of the assassin mains uh, wants to try the new <laughs> the new hot on the street, right? And that's why we also see a majority of the uh, Sens versus Katsu, right? But we still see Katsu having the best uh, upside, which is like very, very interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. And Katsu, I think, just arguably has the the better combo, like more consistent combo lines. But like when I look at new, and this is just maybe like some speculation here for me is new feels a lot like Dorinthia in a way because mm. when Dorinthia is new to you like as an opponent you do not know the combat math here you do not right. know what to expect coming onto this Dawnblade where same with new right now we're getting used to these new cards these new new cards and <laughs> <laughs> this is Joke's never going to get old, folks, for the next three months. But nope. um, we have like all these brand new kind of combat tricks that new plays. But, you know, once we figure out the math on them, it's going to be easier to play around it. Where, you know, like you said, Azuri is a little bit more of the question mark. And that's why Azuri had always kind of seen some sort of success in the meta when, you know, before MST was legal. So I think maybe we'll see it like the dust settle a little bit on new, still very powerful deck and then really, really good into certain heroes and certain metas. So like Mm. it's not going to go anywhere. I don't think it's bad by any means, but eventually the better players are going to kind of learn how to calculate what is being presented to me because right. You know, the, the math is there and a lot of the uh, even the equipment, will include into that math uh, based on how many attack reactions you activate in the turn and stuff like that. So very interesting deck. I, I think it's, I mean, it, it's bad news for guardians <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's bad news for yeah. guardians, but, but you know, then you look at a little bit more of the red line decks. They're like, oh, we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't even play blues. So we don't even care. You know, if you want to like, I, I play a lot of Riptide, and my favorite thing is to let them take my intoxicating shot because I want them to attack me with the intoxicating shot because I can make the full use out of the quicken and <laughs> and the courage. But 
any other deck that's running a decent amount of blues that they want to use is a little bit um, upset to see that. So it's very interesting. Now, I think the elephant in the room or the crouching tiger in the room is, <laughs> yes. is Zen. Because, and, and this is something I talked about, uh, you know, on a couple podcasts ago and even, even throughout the set review last week. Zen has had the most kind of groundwork laid for him prior to the set, right? We had seen Crouching Tigers. We had seen some of, like, probably some of the more powerful cards in the Crouching Tiger um, genre or, or archetype that, you know, had seen some play in Katsu and maybe a little bit in Phi to a certain extent. Zen is now poised to take full advantage of that stuff. And I think we're seeing it. What's your take on Zen? How much damage have you taken from Zen? And how much damage will you be taking from Zen? <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> like the Ninja Assemble has risen quite a lot since I played Ninja last time. Now, when sitting on the Guardian side of the table, I'm scared <laughs> going into <laughs> both the Katsus and the Zen because they can present such tremendous amount of damage in such a low. Like it doesn't take them a lot to get there, right? And so Zen has a very interesting proposition in comparison to Katsu, because Katsu has always been like, yeah, you need you need your attack to hit in order for your Katsu to activate, in order for you to toss a card, in order to grab whatever combo piece it is that you're missing, in order to play out your perfect turn, right? But with Zen, it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna transcend, and then I'm just gonna <laughs> do a lookup of whatever power of a card it is that I need for this moment, and then uh, everything is gonna be great. So... There's a lot of less hoops that you need to run through with Zen, and also the fact that you don't have to toss a card in order to activate his ability, or like you have to pay your Shi, right? But that Shi is gonna get back into your deck for usability later in the game, and especially if you shuffle, you're gonna probably see that sooner, yada yada. And so, the upfront, it feels like Zen should be the more powerful ninja from that prospect because. You don't need to run through so many hoops and you can still present a lot of damage and utilizing your Kakara with these tigers is really, really powerful. I mean, at the same time, Katsu has been doing the same Katsu things as he's always been doing, uh, but I think it's going to struggle a lot more into these enigmas if they are going to be more popular because they are going to be able to block a lot more in those early stages of the combat chain, where she just typically wants to hit in order to activate Katsu in order to play out his perfect turn. So there's a lot of variance on Katsu's side of things in order to like... Do that draw the perfect combo line and I don't care if uh, my opponent is going to block me or not because I don't need to fetch whatever combo piece it is that I'm missing. I just have it naturally because that can also happen. So there's a lot of uh, nuance uh, that uh, Sen has provided in terms of like playing the ninja game style a little bit more differently but also has a very very strong uh, explosive uh, power being able to just recur bonds <laughs> and just get fetch more bonds and just like uh, go the whole uh, way and uh, attract the tigers and uh, the art of wars is just like adding on top of that is just mind-blowing uh, but we did see one of the games that i watched this weekend was a uh, fatigue bravo uh, taking down one of the sends uh, this weekend where they basically they presented a ton of damage halfway through the deck and then it started fiddling a little bit trying to find those last like explosive pieces in order to like get over the edge right and the bravo ended up being successful because he had so much uh, remembrances and he was able to recur back his healing uh, abilities and uh, stay on top of his life total and not being worried about dying basically so it was very very fun to see uh, how that game turned out and i think Going into this meta with like looking at the fatigue uh, style of decks, you really, really need to make sure that you get all of the value out of your whole deck, right? And that could be super, super tricky. Yeah, it certainly is. And, and we're going to start to learn over the coming weeks. And I, I do think US Nats will probably be the big uh, benchmark for the rest of the Nats season to kind of look at. Probably. What, what, what can we expect? What did people figure out? What, did, what are people doing to kind of combat these new heroes? And, you know, whether it is something like a fatigue kind of thing going into at least two of these heroes probably can work. Uh, yeah, I don't know about the Enigma matchup. That sounds a little bit miserable to no. me. No, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and, you know, and do we see some rogue heroes like, you know, I, I, I feel like Vincent is probably not being looked at enough. Vincent got a brand new spanking awesome card in the eulogy and also has like a silver bullet into Enigma. And certainly exactly. there's a ways Enigma can play around it. It's it's a little bit hard to do that because if Vincent's still 
presenting a lot of damage. It's going to be a tough, uh, tough sledding, but it is going to be interesting to see if any of these dark horses kind of rise up. Now I have a question for you, Erica, hmm? two questions, actually the first one, I've had a lot of questions, it's almost like it's a podcast or something. The first question <laughs> is, um, <laughs> if you were a player going to us Nats, right. And perhaps you didn't want to play a new hero or perhaps we're not able to get hands on new product or something like that, but you still have a decent collection. You can probably build a lot of the older heroes. Um, what would, what were, what are some heroes not from MST that you would consider into the meta that probably have decent game into these, at least some of these new heroes. I think the top three, <laughs> I would say, is probably Leviah, it's probably Azalea, and it's probably... Hmm, Zen or Katsu, I haven't made up my mind yet which one I prefer the most. I want to say Zen, but <laughs> I wasn't allowed to play the new hero, so I'm going to play with Katsu then. Uh, because I think both Leviah and Azalea are really, really interesting uh, styles going into this meta. And I'm surprised to see that Azalea didn't do too well uh, in the last Battle Harden, considering that she has so much more offensive capability and uh, she is so punishing for decks that wants to go wide, aka Zen, aka Katsu, aka all the Nidias and, uh, and the like. So I was very curious to see that not a single Azalea uh, made it near the top from this past weekend. And um, Levia, we already, Levia, we already talked about her. She is just a powerhouse, but uh, suffers a little bit from her own uh, graveyard and banish management. And if you mis miscompute, miscompute that, then you're gonna falter. So Levi has a lot of things going for her, but uh, there's a lot of uh, moving parts that you need to make sure to stay on top of in order to master that one a bit. So, and also a lot of, uh, like for both of these decks, there's a lot of variance for both of these, like depending on what you draw. Do you see those early blood rushes? Do you see those early red in the edges or not in matches where those are um, key? So they have a lot of interesting things going for them. And Katsu is just because like <laughs> Katsu is uh, such a cool uh, ninja to see coming back. Uh, from the good old days before Phi was in existence and before Zen was in existence. And uh, it's uh, really fun to see that he still has game, <laughs> even though these new heroes look potentially better on paper. But uh, I'm interested to see uh, where Katsu is going to land in this one. Yeah, it's interesting. Azalea is tough. And to be honest, I feel like a lot of people are packing a lot more war warmongers again. Um, mm. Maybe because... Uh, because of Azalea or maybe because, you know, uh, they're afraid of something else. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what they'd be afraid of other than Azalea for Warmongers. I mean, you know, most decks can usually get around it, but um, it is interesting. I think Katsu is probably a great pick as well. Uh, interesting that you don't say KO over Leviah. I, I, I think Leviah is certainly a, a powerhouse here, right? Just amazing numbers and got a, a an insane new card in the expansion slot but ko still is the more consistent brute deck do right we, do do we think we're gonna we're gonna be stuck with not stuck with ko do you think we're gonna have ko for a little bit longer than we thought because you know people were thinking it's like oh man i'm gonna be able to i'm not even be able to play with this armory deck that i bought if if he lls before amsterdam and now obviously they changed the points but also Maybe these heroes are gatekeeping him a little bit. Yeah, I think Kayo saw a lot of buzz with this new armor deck that came out recently, and that people were just like, "Yeah, this this is gonna seal the deal. Kayo is gonna be the best deck in the format, no no questions about it." And then we saw so many Kayos going into Warsaw, and at the end of the day, we looked at the top scoring board of uh, like the top twenty heroes represented, and there was like only like a couple Kayos in like the top twenty, and it was so interesting to see like how many chaos went into that tournament and like people just feeling like yeah ko is the way to go and then at the end of the day it's like i think it was maybe one ko in the top eight at the end like they just dis disapparated into themselves right and uh, it was so interesting to see how that one uh, panned out and so that makes me think that ko i mean ko is uh, very lenient in terms of like stability contra Leviah, who's like uh, super high upside, very low floor in terms of <laughs> like uh, variance. But like, I think Kayo is just, 
I'm not sure what Chaos problem is at the end of the day, but like the results is not there. Uh, so there must be something, right? I mean, on paper, he looks very strong and very potent, and it's like, it must be a go-to deck at some at some point, but yeah, he doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't pull through. I get, my, my best guess is when, when I look at, you know, I forget who we had on a couple weeks ago. I, we talked about Kale a lot, but like if we were to get rid of Kale, right, or, or to ban something to, to slow the progress at the time, we were talking about mm. you, you ban... Wild Ride and Bear Fangs. The, the the two cards are like so much upside in KO and not really a right. lot in the other brute decks. But then you and you're saying, well, th- these are like some serious power cards outside of like Cast Bones and and Blood Rush Bellow. These are the two power cards in KO in a lot of ways. And then you think mm. about it, they don't block. I mean, they're the they, uh, the classic brute problem. They don't block. Right. And a lot of these new heroes. Uh, will take advantage of that. So and right. and and a lot of the heroes that are coming out. So that could be it. Who knows? Um, and then the final question before we get to some listener questions is, uh, and I think he kind of answered it. Which of these three heroes would you bring to US Nats if you were going? The brand new heroes. Oh, the brand new heroes. Probably Zen. Yeah. <laughs> Probably Zen. Because uh, I think his explosive enough is just uh, like out the roof and. Uh... With only one week to practice, since I have those uh, ninja roots, <laughs> basically. The play style is not that hard for me to interpret and learn. I think Enigma is probably the hardest one uh, to learn, followed by Nu, in order to learn the play lines, in order to maximize your uh, win potential in terms of the different uh, oppositions that you're going to face, right? But with Zen, it's like my <laughs> old ninja bread and butter, so it's probably out of a comfort uh, zone pick that I'm gonna that I would lean on to in that case. Great answer, great answer. Now, we have some listener questions. First comes from Gary, a.k.a. Mr. Viz, who asks, what are you most excited about having another pro tour in Europe? What's the best place for people to visit in Amsterdam, if you've been? Ooh, yes, I've been to Amsterdam. And, uh, I mean, walking along the water pathways and the bridges and uh, making sure to watch out for all the bicyclists because it's a bicycling nation. <laughs> on the next level mm-hmm. uh, so make sure that you don't get overrun by a bike and make sure to stay clear of the <laughs> bike pass because people are going to be mad at you um, but yeah there is uh, the Anne Frank Museum which is really really powerful if you get if you have some time over and do one activity during the weekend I think that one is really really powerful and really really inspiring um, experience and uh, apart from that there's also like a chocolate factory where you can make your own chocolate if that's what you're into and uh, that's one of the things that I put on my to-do list when I'm there <laughs> Uh, excited about that and uh, yeah super excited to have a pro tour uh, in Amsterdam it's just like a one and a half hour or two hours uh, flight from me so super excited to see everybody come together on uh, European turf again yeah it should be interesting I mean you know last pro tour was pretty hype especially that last match I hope that it lives Mm. up to the hype in Amsterdam it's going to be and we're going to have all these crazy new heroes too so it's going to be a lot of fun to see what shakes out now Capolo asks what is your favorite judge promo so far and what would be your ideal uh, adjudicator equipment I had a tough time reading oh god (laughs) I don't even know the adjudicator equipment on top of my head my boyfriend loves uh, these uh, judge uh, promos and the judge heroes and the adjudicator uh, thingies I have not played (laughs) or tried to play any of them I'm gonna be honest Uh, so I'm not sure Uh, but like I really really loved what they did with the promotional uh, packs that whenever you judge a tournament there is uh, this little judge pack that you get right and it's like a random assortment of uh, cards both highs and lows right Uh, the sink belows and the face are absolutely gorgeous like uh, some of the calls for us in there are uh, some of my favorite uh, like uh, if I ever get enough money (laughs) to invest in those type of things it's only a it's also a problem because I don't really want to play them in my deck because they're so pretty Uh, so it's probably when I just stuck them on my shelf and just look at them Uh, but also Rast Angel I don't have to. I have. To, I don't. I can't forget about Rast Agent <laughs> being a guardian main uh, of sorts. Uh, it's one of the also 
prettiest uh, cards that came out in those sets. So super excited to see what more cold foils is going to come out uh, in the upcoming uh, judge packs. And uh, it's a really, really nice incentive uh, to the judge community to have those little golden nuggets pieces that you can only get through these adventures. And yeah, such a great uh, effort by LSS to, to bring that on. Yeah, yeah. The judges are important. And you got to, you know, it, this is a pretty awesome thing to do. So shout out mm. LSS. You're doing a great job. Now, Erica, this is a, a pleasure as always. I mean, I would love to have you again. This is amazing. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so for, much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming on. Please plug anything you'd like to plug. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, you can find me on uh, X former Twitter. Uh, I'm sad that they changed the uh, URL because now it feels like I'm going to a uh, adulterated uh, website every time I try to uh, browse the latest news in the Flesh and Blood uh, community. Uh, but I'm at Erika Forsloff uh, over there. You can hit me up and follow uh, my adventures throughout the Flesh and Blood community. Next up for me is uh, national season, so I will let you all know how I'm going to do there and my preparation going into that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be commentating Amsterdam Pro Tour uh, in July mm. so super excited to be doing that together with uh, a branch among folks that is going to be tuning up there some of people you are probably hopefully as excited as I am to uh, see in the casting booth there for the first time in the Flesh and Blood community so and uh, after that I'm going to Osaka and uh, if I do well at Nationals hopefully Hopefully, <laughs> I get to play Worlds. We'll see about that. I'm going to do my best uh, to top eight uh, my uh, Swedish nationals in order to grant me that invite. And regardless, I'm going to be in Osaka because uh, me and my friends already decided to go there this year. And so it timed really, really well uh, with the Osaka announcement uh, that they did at PTLA. And so uh, we were already going there in October. And now we're going to finalize the whole trip uh, with this uh, Worlds in Osaka. So it's going to be absolutely amazing. So if you want to follow me along for that journey... Probably the best way is on Twitter at Erika Forsloff. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So looking forward to you in the booth at Amsterdam. I will be here watching. Maybe I'll be. There's actually a battle hardened in, in Baltimore. Maybe I'll go to that, I think, that weekend. So, And then I'll be playing and watching, which is nice. The time difference will be able to, uh, easier to do both. Um, you can continue to find nice. me on Twitter at FreshBudsPod. Uh, we had the Buds Discord. It's a great place to hang out. Uh, YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, give us a little like, comment, subscribe, Spotify, or whatever. You can usually rate on there. That helps us be more discoverable. It's the best way to help the show. Uh, we have a Patreon if you'd like to check that out as well. And then also weekly, I do another podcast with my cousin where we talk about indie video games called Fresh Juice. Please check that out. It's a great time over there. We uh, talked about an interesting game this week and also hot dogs. That was a lot of fun. And speaking of hot dogs... I always like to end the show with some food. Erica, what is some food that you've been enjoying or you're looking forward to enjoying or something you just want to shout out? Ooh, uh, speaking of uh, Pro Tour Amsterdam, if you go there, they have these they have these mini pancakes called poffages, mm. and you get those with uh, Nutella and uh, some powdered sugar, and they're absolutely amazing. Or if some fruits like blueberries or strawberries and like. I, I, the form factor in and of itself doesn't say a lot because it's this tiny little mini pancakes but they're just like so delicious and you get the crunchy bits and the spicy bits and uh, everything in one in one bite so if you are going to Proto Amsterdam make sure to uh, get yourself some puffages I guess I should go get my passport updated because that sounds amazing um, <laughs> wow um, thank you all thank you Erica we don't have time for Charmer that's okay we'll get to him eventually Please have a good week.